Sirius XM 106. It is volume. Nick Carter and Lori Majewski checking in. In the past 24 hours, we've been rocked by the passing of a bunch of people. Of course, legendary musician Alan White, the great Ray Liotta, and a particular sensitivity to those on this show, the great Andy Fletcher, a.k.a. Flesh. Fletch of Depeche Mode has passed at 60. So to help us sift through the grief and... Um, just the greatness. Michael Pagnata is here. Uh, Roger O'Donnell of The Cure will be joining us very shortly. But um, you okay? I can hear you breathing, Lori. This is tough. This is a tough one for you, I know. I haven't processed it yet, if I can be honest. I yesterday was sitting down uh, to get my hair colored. Very Depeche Mode thing to do. And um, my I'm not kidding. My best friend from childhood, the one that uh, I went to see many, many Depeche Mode concerts with, the one that I would ride in my car, you know, with the, I'm taking a ride with my best friend, yeah. blaring out. Um, and the one that I've met Fletch and many, many times hung out with them. And she called me and she said, Lori, I need to know if this is real. And I said, what? And, and she said, is Fletch dead? And... I said, I mean, I didn't hear anything. And she says, well, I don't know about this Twitter thing, but this Depeche Mode Twitter is saying that he died. And I'm thinking, oh, is it like a fan thing? And I logged in to see that it was the Depeche Mode official Twitter. And it was only three or four minutes after they had posted. And no one else had really been talking about it yet. And so I had to call... I had to t- text Michael Pagnata. Right. Well, Michael. I knew he would know. Yeah. Michael Pagnata, for those who don't know, has had a long standing, both personal and professional relationship with the band and those in it. And I have to tell you, Michael, um, the first time I met them, Depeche Mode, of course, Dave was not there, uh, as Dave was wont to not be there. But I will never forget. I, this is like between 101 and. Um, uh, yeah, just before, right? Yeah, it was like around 101 time. I just started in radio and I was doing a meet and greet with them and somebody had told them that I was an enormous fan. And I'll never forget, this was the first time I met them and, and him. Fletch was the first one to stride across the room, hand outstretched and said, hi, thanks for all your support over the years. And I mean, that's what I will remember most. That I mean, you know, Martin Gore was Martin Gore, of course. Dave was nowhere to be found, but Fletch was the one who literally, like, made the effort. So my question is, I guess, how are you feeling uh, as somebody who's been close to the band forever? And just what are your initial thoughts? Uh, Oh, boy. I mean, much like Lori, um, this was totally unexpected. I mean, it was, first of all, I should just say, it was totally unexpected. Uh, I was driving. A few calls came through to my cell phone, and I just, I didn't pick up. I mean, I I didn't recognize the number. um, And I just said, okay, well, I'll deal with this in a few minutes or a half hour when we get back. And then for some weird reason at a red light, I checked my messages and there was a message. I'm sure he won't mind me saying, saying this, but there was a message from Roger O'Donnell from The Cure, who is a mutual friend of ours. And he said, listen, I have to tell you something. I don't know if you've heard. And he said, uh, Fletch has died. And I, I, I pulled over in shock, and I started to, at that point, reach out um, to people that I know, like everyone in the band and management and so on, and nothing was coming back. And then Lori got in touch, and um, Roger had said it hadn't been announced yet, so there was nothing quite to see yet. And I think, Lori, I think you actually sent me the band announcement, um, and yeah. that was when I kind of believed it. I mean, I know that. I know that that channel um, that they communicate through. And so, uh, yeah, I was just, Nick, I was just in shock. I mean, Fletch, you know, he was my first point of contact with Depeche Mode. Um, he was largely the reason why I got hired. And uh, we've been friends. And, I, I, you know, I know that publicists and managers like, oh, they're my good friend, say that stuff all the time. But you know, I was friends with Depeche Mode and am friends with Depeche Mode in a way that I probably ha- have never been friends with any other client I've ever had 
And, you know, first among those would be Fletch in that band. Can I ask this question, too? Because yeah. I was thinking about this uh, walk into work. Um, uh, two things. First of all, now, sadly, Dave is the last original member standing left in the band. Well, well actually, no. Oh, Dave, Dave really came, Dave oh, came that's right, at the that's very right, end right. of the beginning. I stand correct. It, all right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, it was Martin and Vince, and of course, Vince now left right. years and years ago, but uh, it was it's it's Martin and, right. and Fletch that were at there at the beginning. Well, here's what I was thinking. Okay, so of course, since Martin is known to be the principal songwriter, and that caused some tension between he and Dave, you know, for a while, and Dave obviously wanted to do, you know, his own thing and write songs, and so he forms his own band outside of Depeche as well. Right. And you remember very vividly when they were having the very public issues around songs of faith and devotion, and Dave was, you know, going through whatever he was going through. I think largely as a result of sort of the frustration of not, you know, feeling like he wasn't being rewarded creatively and being allowed to write more of the songs. I wonder if Fletch was kind of Switzerland in a sense between Martin. And Dave, because, I mean, you know, Fletch has done so many interviews and he's talked about it being a brotherhood and this and, you know, and it's egalitarian and if one doesn't want to do it, we don't do it. But th that's kind of rarely the case in any band, you know. Mm. Well, D uh, Depeche Mode is a band. Um, people that know them and know, know them well realize that it's a band of very strong personalities. It always was. When Vince was there, it was like that. And when Alan came in, it was like that. And the period that you mentioned, I mean, that Songs of Faith and Devotion time was a very, very rough time for millions of reasons. I mean, there were all these amazing things happen, happening and then all these terrible things going on at the same time. And while Alan was still there, um, that Switzerland role, which you're right about, um, was a little bit less significant for Fletch. It was just, it was less Fletch able to broker things uh, then it was kind of resentments going on between all of them. But once Alan left, largely over those resentments, um, that's when I think Fletch had to really become not just, you know, the guy in interviews who would say, well, I do crossword puzzles, you know, and, you know, kind of jokingly. That's when I think he really had to be in a position to negotiate the continued existence of Depeche Mode. I mean, it wasn't a little, wasn't a little thing. You know, it was a very, very tough time, and it went on for almost 10 years, I would say. Maybe a little less than that, but something like that. Can we talk about when Fletch left the group for a little bit? Because that that is when I I, I was just... Un <laughs> well, because it was so confusing. I, I tried to explain this to people um, because I did a cover story with them, um, what, and and Fletch was talking about leaving to become their accountant. And, mm. you know, I was so young and I was sitting there going, why, why would you want to be their accountant? And eventually he comes back. So yeah. what happened there? Because it was a while. First of all, you have to take some of this stuff, you know, with a grain of salt. I mean, Fletch was a guy with a great and very dry sense of humor and he knew what had been reported about him. He knew what people thought about him, not so much the fans um, who knew what his role actually was, but just people in the media and stuff. So he could give you that. But the, 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 the reason, I think the time you're referring to is when he had to leave the tour. And the reason why that happened was because he was having really, really bad problems, struggles with mental illness. This was a lifelong struggle. Struggle. It went back to, I think, what we would call his high school days. There was a death in, in his family that affected him very deeply. And, you know, I know some others in the band blame that on a certain amount of anxiety that he carried with him that as the band grew and got bigger, um, kind of exploded inside of him and he couldn't control. And it did get to the point where at the end of the first leg of the devotional tour, which was almost a year, actually, I talk about a leg. I mean, it was a year. There was so much pressure on everybody. There was a lot of bad stuff going on. We've talked about it before. It was like the most debauched tour in history. If you go and read the story in Q Magazine, they actually call it that, which is pretty ironic given their reputation, but that's what it was. And I think it all just got to be too much. And he decided that he couldn't continue on the next leg, which was basically a summer and fall leg. And he had to be replaced by our good friend, Daryl Bamante, who was the band's primary assistant and Perry Bamante's from The Cure at that time, his brother. So 
Fletch just needed some time away. And he took it. And, you know, he came back and it took him a while. Um, but it was, you know, I mean, we all need a mental health break. And that's really what it was. It's just in his case, think about it. Being in Depeche Mode at that time with a number one record around the world and a gigantic tour and there's all this pressure and you don't know how to process it. So I think inside the band, everybody was understanding, but it was a very difficult time. Well, especially then, it's kind of like the most, it seems to, I'm sure most people listening, the most counterintuitive thing in the world because you go, well, that's the dream. Why else are you in a band? But you're right. It's like being in... I mean, not even a pressure cooker, but, you know, it's interesting, too. Um, and would, people say De- Depeche isn't a rock band. I know, right? Yeah, that ain't true. Yeah. <clears throat> I was thinking last night, too. Okay, so you and Roger were just uh, discussing off mic before we got on about how when we get to a certain age, you kind of, you know, these things become a little more uh, prevalent, you know, yeah. uh, the passing of, of folks like this. but. You know, as much as Depeche Mode seems and feels like they were with us forever, this man was only 60. That's the real shock here. You know, they started very young. Yeah. Very young. They were, in, they were teenagers and um, childhood friends. You're just talking about who came into the band when and so on. Well, the band really started when Vince Clark and Andy, who were kind of, you know, childhood friends in Basel and joined their version of the Christian Boy Scouts, which was called the Boys Brigade. And they used to go on these, you know, hiking trips and all this other stuff. And that was really where their musical relationship started. I mean, neither of them, you know, Vince played a little guitar and Fletch played a little bass. And actually, this is weird, but when when the message came through, it's like your your mind floods back. For some reason, it always floods back to the beginning. And I remember the day that I work, walked into the studio, they were working on some music and Fletch, you know, sat down next to me and he said, you know, I play bass, you know, just to kind of let me know that he, you know, that he could play music too or make music too. And I, I, I for some reason, I never forgot that. I, I didn't need to know that. And I think I knew it anyway, but it was important for him to tell me that he could play the bass. So he well, invented It was important it for them actually, to all know that. Yeah. I mean, that's so, the thing. They started as... A guitarist band. People no don't romance realize in China, that. Very briefly. Well, yeah. And then they met it's Martin. Hard, it's hard to remember. <laughs> composition of sound. Yeah, it's hard to remember that for the longest time, people thought if you were in a keyboard band, you weren't doing anything. It's like somehow, like the keyboards were playing themselves, and you were just sort of standing around looking cool. You know, that's just Trust never. Me, it wasn't real play. music. Yeah. I mean, my reason for getting involved in the music business to begin with, even though I was very fortunate, worked with some you know huge rock acts before them. Um, my reason for getting involved in music was to work with Depeche Mode and The Cure. Those two were my, my priorities. I, I was working with George Michael and Prince, and that was amazing, but I wanted Depeche Mode. And I chased them, man. I chased them like I have never chased anybody. And um, finally, when the opportunity came, I was so thrilled. And then I realized that, you know, all these cool people that, or people that I thought were so cool just thought what they were doing was just shit and wow. inauthentic and not worth covering. And, um, you know, I carried that resentment for a lot of years, but you're absolutely right. Keyboard music, synthesizer music, what programmed music was not real music. In the end, they won. But at that time, it was a very difficult job. Well, that's funny because we have a, a, a keyboard player about to join us. And I just want to read this quote about uh, from Fletch that um, it was posted on Duran Duran's uh, Twitter yesterday, but it's, it's, a fam- it's a pretty famous quote. He said, there is this big misunderstanding that in guitar pa- bands, real men are working real instruments evening after evening, while in a synthesizer band like Depeche Mode, nobody works because it's all machines. But that's bullshit. <laughs> that's pretty rock and roll. It is. It is. It is, too. All right, listen, we're going to take a quick break. Fletch. As Lori mentioned, uh, Roger O'Donnell of uh, Cure Fame is going to be joining us very shortly. Uh, a lot to do today. Um, and respect to Lori. She's actually holding it together better than, better than I expected, uh, which is a lot. Uh, listen, we'll be right back on Feedback for Friday. Oh, the wonder of analog synthesizers. Sirius I love XM, seeing 106, what Ryan's volume. choosing. 
We're not choosing the music. You should know that. The, the hardcore Depeche people are not choosing the music. Young Ryan Well, is. all right. I chose I'm Just Can't Get that. Enough. That's okay. I approve. I, cho- I chose Just Can't Get Enough. Just I do, too. But it's so sweet when a 22-year-old doesn't know what a Depeche or a mode is. Because I didn't want him to get into it. trouble. I didn't want him to get into trouble. Anyway. All right. So it's volume. Nick Carter, Lori Majewski, uh, of course, Michael Pagnotta is with us. And uh, there's a little band perhaps you've heard of called The Cure. Uh, the name has come up a few times on this show. Uh, a good friend of our show who's been with us many times, Roger O'Donnell, is joining us. And apparently, sir, you were the one who started the chain reaction of notification uh, via text uh, through Michael Pagnotta, which I guess was confirmed by two Lori Majewski. I mean, I, I can only imagine that you are probably even in more of a state of shock than any of us. Uh, well, yeah, I was um, I was talking to uh, Daryl Bramante, who, who of course worked with The Cure for years, and also toured with Depeche when I think Andy took uh, a tour off. And I talked to Daryl probably every day, and we were chatting, and he said, "Hang on a minute, my phone's going crazy. What what's going on?" And then he said, "Fletch has died," and I was like, "What?" I mean, it was just uh, just shock. And then I thought. Um, you know, I, I said, okay, we won't say anything to anyone, but I thought I'd tell Mike because I know how, how close he was. And I also told Michael um, Ertel, who's um, one of their close security guys. And just, well, obviously nobody believes it, do they? It's mm. just complete shock. And, and was Daryl like, was Daryl was actually my first text after you. So yeah. it was just this strange loop. And I started to reach out to, you know, everyone that we know. And then the actual announcement came, which Lori sent to me. And then it was pretty clear what was happening. And, uh, you know, throughout the rest of the afternoon, people started reaching out. I just have one question, and I'm going to get out of the way because I know Lori has a million. Um, (laughs) Just as uh, uh, from a technical standpoint, I feel like, you know, and Fletch is very much, uh, Michael was talking about his dry sense of humor, and he, he, he would make comments about how, yes, he was a musician, but... You know, he was not acknowledged as a rock star because he wasn't the charismatic one. I'm like, look, you're impossible to miss if you're seen walking down the street. But, you know, if you're in a band with personalities like Martin Gore, like David Gahan, I wonder if it gets lost in the sauce um, just in terms of how good a player he was. So just what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't think Fletch would ever stand, hold his hand up and say he was the greatest keyboard player in the world. That wasn't why he was there. Um, he was like a founding member, you know. It's like he, he, and I've heard him referred to as the glue that kept Martin and Dave together through the, through you know, some of the hard times. And maybe he was like kind of the rock that um, everything else kind of wavered about on because let's be honest, there were some wavering times back in the, well, Mike can tell you, you know, when Dave was uh, in a state and, uh, you know, you don't have to be the, I mean, it is, you don't have to be the greatest musician in the world uh, to be in a band. That's not how it starts. When a bunch of school friends get together, you don't say, Oh, you're shit. You're not in the band. It's like, Okay, let's form a band, and then everybody gets better together. Uh, and you know, Fletch was uh, was what he was, wasn't he? He was uh, he was just that big guy that was always there, and with all the best stories. I mean, seriously, and willing to tell them. You know, that that's the thing. I mean, he was. You know, I said he was my point of contact at the very very beginning, but he was everybody's point of contact. Nick, you had a story about him walking over to you in an event. And thanking you, Lori, uh, spent time with him. He was the guy, he was the public face of Depeche Mode. And yeah. because those guys are like, you know, they're looking at their shoes all the time when you're talking to them, you need a guy like that. You need a guy who believes in what they were doing. So, as Roger says, especially during that period in the 90s when things got really, really bad, he was, you know, beyond even the glue. He was a cheerleader for the band. He was the guy who believed in the band enough to, to do and say whatever he could to keep the thing going. And he also was the interface with Jonathan Kessler, who would go on to become their manager. Fletch never really managed the band. He just took the greatest interest in those sides of things. Because I'll tell you something, Roger, you you can relate to this. At the end of the devotional tour, the first leg, with that monstrous tour going around the world, they hadn't made a penny. 
I mean, they had to go on and do that second leg because the shit was so expensive. And I think from then on, that was when everybody started to pay more attention because Dave's in a terrible state. He's gone and done every single show for a year in his condition. Not just him either. It was everyone. But, you know, now they've got to do another six months just to make a few bucks. I mean, it was a crazy proposition. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Fletch really stepped up into that into that gap. Uh, going back to the kind of technical side of things, the last time I hung out with them, uh, I was talking to Martin about um, modular synths and equipment, you know, because he's totally into all that stuff. And then Fletch comes and said, look, Roger, I've got a really serious question I need to ask you about, about your cure shows. And he's like, you play for three hours, don't you? He's like... How do you how do you not go for a piss in the middle of it? <laughs> See, that was the difference between Fletch. Someone invent a sequencer quickly, quickly. <laughs> how, how am I supposed to stand there for three hours? You know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I mean, we should say, and there, I mean, there was just as I was coming on, there was a a local news report, and I couldn't believe it. It was like Channel Five or something at local news, and they did like a thirty second package. And there were actual videos of Fletch singing and playing, you know, and a lot of times he was miming, but not always. And I thought they've found the only 30 seconds that exists of, <laughs> of Fletch singing on a mic for this piece. And I just thought, I just thought, well, he would love that, you know, because when they did start, he was, I mean, he did play the bass parts. And as times went on, um, he wound up, I mean, it was pretty much samples. I mean, he had the samples to hit. They brought Peter Gordino in to do, you know, the real sort of heavy keyboard work. Martin supplemented that. But Fletch did have his, you know, he had his samples and his cues. And he hit them. And his claps. Yes, his hand claps. And the yeah. Kung Fu kicks. Don't forget the Kung Fu kicks. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> kicks. <laughs> I mean, but, you know, to the point you're making, Roger, there's something to be said, honestly, having seen the band many, many times. He was a tremendous stage presence. He really was. Yeah. Just to have him there really was well, the you know, red hair. <laughs> and those glasses. <laughs> the white skin. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't matter. I mean, I've become more aware of seeing iconic bands recently, or not well, not recently, over the last because <laughs> we haven't seen anything, have we? But you look at you look at the stage and you see the three of them and they're Depeche Mode. It yeah. doesn't matter what what he does, it doesn't matter how good he is at playing. He's the guy, he's one of the guys that put it together in the beginning. And if it wasn't for him, it would it wouldn't still be there, I'm sure of that. So you look at these guys and you, you know, you take it all in and make the most of it. And it's just. Well, the natural question for, that leads from that is we've all been thinking us hardcore fans, does Depeche Mode go on from here? And musically, I, you know, they can. But there's something, and to go back to that relationship between The Cure and Depeche Mode, there's something about loyalty, about coming from a small town in England, about how we, uh, our roles in the band. It's not just about, you know, the front man with the charisma and the songwriter. There's something else like that, that works in that band. And that, because, you know, people who are music people said to me yesterday, of course they can go on, Laurie. And I'm like, well, yes, I mean, they can make albums and they can tour, but there is a little bit of a magic you know, seasoning that is missing that may make them think we've done this enough. I mean, what do you think coming from a band of brothers? Yeah, it's going to be tough, isn't it? But I think they'll carry on. I, 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 do. I, I think they will, yeah. I mean, they've got millions of fans worldwide and it was like the Stones when Charlie died. I mean, you know. They carried on and they sort of, it's like a celebration of him, isn't it? It will be, uh, yeah. I mean, making it personal, I don't know what would happen if one of us, God forbid, uh, got ill or it's just something you don't even think about. I mean, it's like Fletch, it's like six of your, it's not even on your radar that he could be. He's just like always that. been there, right? I mean, yeah. you, you can't really conceive of it with, without him, you know? But I guess I felt that way when Alan left, you know. I, I thought, well, yeah. well, this is it, you know. But um, you may be right. I mean, they may continue. Certainly there'll be, you know, a lot, of, a lot of fan demand. But it will be a different thing because he was just such, such the face of the band that it's, you know, because touring is, it's not just about what you do on stage. It's about everything else that goes on around it. 
And yeah, you know, the bit on the stage is the bit that everyone sees, but it's the smallest part of the day. Yeah, you know, yeah it's exactly. the people that make everyone laugh yeah. through the rest of the day, and and you know, so uh, getting getting between two uh, two other members when they're not getting on and make every, you know making yeah. everyone laugh. Yeah, it's, or, uh, or, or not. I mean, he was a, he was a guy you could argue with very easily. I mean, he was a man <laughs> of very definite opinions, and a lot of us spent a lot of time arguing with him about almost anything. But but it was always good natured. I mean, and he was funny. I mean, he actually he told a really funny story about when they were first starting. He uh, and the rest of the guys were rehearsing in Vince Clark's house in the mother in their garage, and his mom, Vince's mom, got really upset because they were too loud. So they all put their headphones on <laughs> so that she wouldn't hear anything. And then she came out 10 minutes later and said that the clicking of the keys. <laughs> so they do a silent disco and it's still annoying. <laughs> so they had to stop. <laughs> All right, let us, let us reintroduce. It's the kind of neuroses that runs through that band from the very beginning. But I just, he, was, he just thought that was the funniest thing in the world. And it must have been. Let know? us reintroduce everybody. That's Michael Pagnotta, of course, and Roger O'Donnell is with us. You know, two things come to mind immediately. Lori and I have kind of talked about this ad nauseum. Uh, it's bittersweet about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Thank God they got in uh, yeah. while Fletch is still with us. But, you know, just the disappointment in not being able to see them, you know, perform, because you know they would have torn that place in half. But, you know, Michael, I wonder, I mean, unless it's, I mean, if we're, if I'm getting too personal, let me know. I know you have a very personal relationship with Vince Clark. Um I gotta imagine this has hit him like a like a sledgehammer. Well, I think Fletch is one of his oldest friends, and his was the second text that I sent because I didn't I didn't quite know even what to say to him. And um, you know, someone inside had reached out to him to tell him, which I thought was really very nice. And you know, Vince is going through a lot right now, and um, he's you know he's a, he sort of deals with what's in front of him. And I could just tell from his responses to me that. It was terrible and hurtful. I'm going to see him later or tomorrow, and I'm sure we'll talk about it. But, um, yeah, I mean, they, they started this whole thing. I mean, if not for them, as Roger says, none of this would have happened. So I, I, I'm sure he's feeling it. And just whenever a childhood friend, an old friend dies, famous, not famous, um, it just drags you back to that time. And, uh, you know, and they kept their relationship. His, Vince's relationship with the others was not as good, I think, for competitive reasons. But with Fletch, it was always there. I think Fletch always had that that close personal feeling for uh, for Vince. Um, I want to. I just want to mention we're getting tweets, and and you just said when someone passes, this was an untimely pass. That is the quote that Depeche Mode used in their official Twitter announcement. Um, untimely. They also said natural causes. Uh, so this. People who are speculating this is not suicide, this is not drugs related. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. The band has not yet come forward with details, so we're just going to leave it at that. Um, natural causes. So, you know, this we know he didn't have cancer. It wasn't like he was, you know, in the hospital for weeks. That is what is so shocking about this to the community. And, uh, you know, we started when you, when you logged in. Um, uh, Roger, we started talking about the relationship between The Cure and Depeche and how quickly this news spread in this community. Um, you, you you said that you had talked about at one point maybe even touring together. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because, I mean, well, that is just a mind-blowing thing. Yeah, I think it was probably early 90s. Everybody was like, oh, why don't you oh guys tour? Oh, my God, Ben! <laughs> The and it would have of been, your powers. It would have been like, you know, the space-time continuum, I think. It would have just been too... Uh, we couldn't have done it. So we finally played... Um, like, who goes on? Who's the headliner? Who goes on last? Well, just too, no question about that. Ah, <laughs> that's, that's just too much rock. There's too much. we we got to scale it back. It's too much rock for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> we finally did Austin City Limits. Uh, together in when was it, Mike? Uh, uh, 2012 or 13, something like that. Something like that. I know, and I was not there, and I kick myself off. Yeah, it was time. like those was things separated by a weekend or something, and it was uh, Depeche Mode and The Cure. Yeah, 
I think you were supposed to come, Laurie, but you said you didn't want to stand around in a muddy field all day, <laughs> as if we would have let you do that. But it or did, Duran it was playing with, that night. <laughs> no, I... Like, uh, crazy. <laughs> seems to remember. But we went out. We, I went out with Martin and uh, Fletch and Vince was doing a... We went to see Vince do a DJ set. So uh, that was that was nice. But, I mean... Um, Perry, who used to be in The Cure, he went to school with Martin and all those guys. Yeah, and, and Darryl, Vince and Alison yeah. Moyer. Yeah, um, and Daryl, who was um, our tour manager for many years, he um, he went to school with them, and he actually played in Depeche Mode on the tour. when well, he, um, he was the guy who replaced Fletch when yeah. Fletch had his, his madness for a moment. Yeah, <clears throat> so... Uh, there's, you know, uh, I always go and see Depeche Mode. Where, whenever I'm in the same city, I always go and see mm. it. It's just an amazing experience, isn't it? All those Bazard and boys and, you know, and they're all the same. They're, they're, they haven't changed. The exact and same. Fletch was the exact, you know, he's the, the biggest one of them all. <laughs> and, and he'd be the first to come up to you and say, hello, what's going on? What are you up to? And, and tell you a story and... You know, I mean, I've got so many stories, but I couldn't tell any of them. So, sorry. There about isn't that. one. Oh, give us one. one. I no. mean, you know, t- 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 <laughs> take, it, take it down to at least rated R. Give us one. No, couldn't do it. What What happens on the road stays on the road. Ah, uh, you sob. Uh, Al- Allison put that out a really nice tweet. I don't know if anybody saw it, but Allison put yeah, out a really nice tweet yesterday yeah. about you know sort of growing up together and how he'd always been a part of her life and everything. It was, that's why well, she, really she had said to me that, that uh, Fletch and, and Martin were the, like they were the Catholic school preppy, very, very well behaved boys. And when they got together with Dave, who was a punk, she couldn't believe it because she just d- could not see. She went to college with Dave as well. And she said I, that he was like such a ruffian. And here he is with these two uniformed Little boys. I was gonna say, <laughs> and she described Martin and Fletch as little boys. I was gonna say, hard to imagine that when you know. Last time I saw Martin, I believe he was wearing like a leather dress or something like that. <laughs> yeah, he got lost for two weeks in Berlin and came back in a dress. We like we need to take a break, but just I guess no, no. I didn't even realize we were on the air. I just yeah. thought friends were hanging out and talking. You know, I'm I'm curious because you just said Roger, you 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 go to see Depeche, Limo Depeche, whenever you're in the same city. Um, Obviously, if you're a Depeche Mode fan, you're very much a Cure fan. Most Cure fans are probably Depeche Mode fans as well. I, I just wonder from the inside looking out, what kind of um, similarities you've seen between your bands? Uh, none, really. All right. I mean, it's like <laughs> completely different music. I know I that, think, but I'm just saying. Yeah, kind of. I think, you know, sensitivity-wise, we're, we're from the same school aren't we you know it's like and we we um we appeal to the to the outsiders of of the community you know the kids high school kids that don't do sports and no i'm not saying that people that do sports kind of like the cure or depression mode but you know it's just we they can we like them from the 1990 darkest. on that's my experience <laughs> we appeal to the darker side i mean I think I've heard a couple of mashups of Cure and De- Depeche Mode songs. Uh, they kind of work. Well, that's a fine answer then, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> All right, listen, we're going to take a quick break. We will be right back on feedback. Go nowhere. I wish we were more like Depeche Mode. <laughs> Let's fucking guitars. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to that Get the Balance Right cover any minute now from you guys. <laughs> This is Feedback with Nick and Lori. Let me take you on a trip. All right, it's volume. Nick Carter, Lori Majewski, Michael Pagnotta, and Roger O'Donnell. Cure there doing their best Depeche Mode impression. Uh, nice one, Roger. You managed to make it darker somehow. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> I, we are the kings of dark. <laughs> the princes you, of But dark not kings. goth. Not goth. Don't ever say that to Robert. Right. I made the mistake of saying it once. You? Never again. In yeah. what context? I don't know. I was probably drunk. 
We're so, probably joking around about being a goth band. He's like, we are not a goth band. It's Deadly so serious. great to be the so king of the day. goths. Wait, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yes, so Michael Pagnana and Roger O'Donnell are here because we are paying tribute to and sort of trying to shake off the shock of losing Fletch, Andy Fletcher of Depeche Mode. It is, it's just surreal to be having this discussion, is it not? It's crazy to hear it, you know, because there is Fletch on stage, and so that's the fan, that's who the fans know, and that's who they'll miss, and that's one part of it. But I think for the people that, that knew him, um, that's, it's such a tremendous loss. It's beyond even a personal loss. It's just everything. When the band come into town, that's who you're having dinner with. That's who you're talking to at the after show. Maybe that's who you're going shopping with. Um, that's who you're making plans with. So it's a, I, I, I really, I can't believe it. And I'm actually, I'm really starting just to feel it this morning. You know, that, that absence yesterday was all shock, but today it's kind of like, wow, he's, he's really not going to be here anymore. It's just, it's just, well, for me, it's just too close. I mean, it's like, you know, you see these other guys. I mean, it's always sad when somebody from the music business or the entertainment industry has died. I mean, like Ray Liotta yesterday, tragic. But when it's somebody that's in a band that's like the same as us, you know, it's like, it's just too close. It's just, and it, way too young. I mean, it was just, it's just a shock, isn't it? What the hell? Yeah. I mean, I think we're Thank all around you. the same age, too. I mean, I know that, you know, I mean, Vince is a year older, Dave's a year younger, but we're all at that age now where, of course, this is, this happens. You just don't think, you know, it's going to happen to him or to us or whatever it is. Well, I wanted to have you guys on today with us because um, this is kind of like an Irish wake, maybe without the drinks. It's early in the morning here, not where Roger uh, is. Speak for yourself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, also, it's. I think it's important that people know that Depeche Mode became Depeche Mode because they wanted to be the cure. That is mm-hmm. like a little bit that, that a lot of people don't realize that Vince and Fletch heard the cure and said, uh, I think we want to be like that. And it's funny because I don't think, I mean, Just Can't Get Enough does not sound anything like anything The Cure has ever done. Maybe Friday I'm in love, sort of, maybe. But it, that, that is, you know, the, the relationship between these two bands, you know, that he wanted, that Vince and Fletch, the original architecture of Depeche Mode was changed. You know, like Vince will tell you, like, Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel were his idols, right, Mar- right, Michael? Yes, and then much. he sees The Cure, and it, it changes everything. And it makes, I remember, like, The Cure was almost, like, exclusively a guitar band then, too, which is the most ironic of all of this. Yeah, I mean, I was in awe of them because they didn't have any guitars back in the day. Well, there were a lot, but, I mean, Thompson Twins, Depeche Mode, all of those, from that period where the guitar was... Uh, hidden away but I guess it always makes its ugly come back at some stage (laughs) well you grew up in England and a friend of mine who grew up in England said Depeche Mode were kind of uncool like in America we you know got them we got the British accents we got the black celebration but he said they were a suburban uncool band in England for so long you know they were a singles band they were pop band until yeah. Anton. Well, yeah, look at the early days. I mean, look at them. Uh, <laughs> Just look at them. <laughs> Just look. <laughs> but, but also, it was very lightweight pop, wasn't it, in the early days? Until somebody said, okay, let's, uh, let's crack America. Let's add some guitars. When was that? I mean, what album was that? 86, I like maybe. That. Was it? You know, I mean, I mean, they, I mean really- they, they always had alternative play here. I yeah. mean, that, you know, I mean, th- from the beginning, but it really was. I mean, it's been said a million times, but it really was the imaging, the branding. It was what Anton brought to that party that put them in a different pl- place, that brought them closer to the cure. Well, just and musically, was- I mean, when, they, when you know, from early on, it's like, new life, new life. It's amazing to see that that band became the band that... But that was said, pure synth, and, yeah. and Vince, Vince likes pop music, right? That's his thing. I mean, it was the same with Yaz, it's the same with Erasure. That's his focus. If he could get on stage and play only hits, he would do that 
every single show and he's perfectly happy to do it. The other guys, I think Martin was looking to do something different. And it's obvious even from that first record. I mean, Martin did write two of those songs on Speak and Spell, and they're completely different than anything else on the record. And Roger, Which you ones? know. What? Good. Uh, the Big Muff and Tora 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 were Martin songs. And Roger, you know, just for those guys in the early days, just from a uh, patient's perspective, you know, I mean, since back then, we're far from, uh, you know, a, a, an easy situation. I mean, the fucking floppy disks changing those on stage and things glitching and 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 yeah. i mean you know they were basically just you know bad computers at that time and the fact that they would actually sort of like you know crash on stage i can't even imagine that go out of tune oh. right yeah <laughs> when um so we used to, during the 89 tour we'd always open with plain song from disintegration and um i had four um, disk drives, floppy disk drives, and they take 40 seconds to load. And between the time of me walking past my tech and give, him giving me the thumbs up and getting to the keyboard and Boris counting one, two, three, four, they all went down. <laughs> so he had to reload them. So 40 seconds of silence, which was, uh, yeah, and Martin was always on the cutting edge of gear. I mean, he still is. He's got a house full of modular synths right now. I'm like, uh, and he always had the latest stuff, like emulators, and uh, they were all, they always had the best sounds. You know, they had the most cutting edge synth sounds, and they still do. And he's, you know, uh, Martin always Martin and Fletch always went out and Fletch DJed all across Europe, didn't he? Yes, um, very successfully. Well, early two thousands, and he was massive. He had like a, a completely other career. And when you're su subject to, you know, all that kind of house music, dance music, you it's very much a part of what, where synths come from or where they go to. And, uh, the, yeah, we've come a long way since then. My All of my uh, on-stage sound runs from a couple of Macs now. There's no, wow. no floppy drives anymore. Well, you know. Well, we don't have much time left, so we I, I'm going to have to cut it here. But I want to say thank you to both of you. And, Roger, please come back on. We did not talk about New Cure and the synths on the New Cure. And we have to talk about your, your new job as a composer. So please come back. Anytime. I'm always happy to see you guys. All right. Roger O'Donnell, Michael Pagnotta, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>